The year was 1951. New York's subway system was enjoying unimaginable post-war ridership numbers, and for the first time in the network's history, the city focused on maintaining rather than further expansion. However, there was a problem. Fare collection was happening in cash instead of tokens, and then later credit cards, meaning that between bus stops and the over 400 subway stations active at the time, the MTA's vast daily revenue was physically distributed thinly between thousands of points throughout the city. And not unlike today, robbery was a major concern. The solution was a small fleet of little-known yellow armored subway trains commonly referred to as the money train. Each unit was complete with two cars, housing collecting agents in one and revenue agents in the other. In total, each train housed approximately 12 agents with one supervisor, all of whom were viciously armed. But how did New York reach this point, and what became of the money train in modern times? Stay tuned to find out, as today we discover New York's lost money train. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. When the subway first opened in 1904, fares were collected in the form of cash. Five-cent coins would unblock the turnstile system, much like your magnetic metro card will today. Some riders found the system to be undignified, as previously turnstiles were mostly associated with livestock, as opposed to humans. However, it was a highly efficient method, allowing the flow of both people and ticket sales. I'd also point out that beyond the turnstile, passengers enjoyed amenities such as cushioned upholstery, wooden panel interiors, and in some cases, a ceiling fan for fresh air during their commute. Anyhow, in the early days of the subway, cash collection was handled differently throughout the system, as the network then was comprised of several companies. The Interborough Rapid Transit Company was the first firm to operate, running the initial lines that ultimately formed the backbone of the system. Later, the Brooklyn Rapid Transit Company and the independent subway system were also established. This situation was not ideal, since the initial development by multiple competing companies resulted in serious inefficiencies. For example, the separate construction efforts led to overlapping lines and redundant infrastructure in some areas, creating inconsistencies in service, different operating standards, and complexities for passengers transferring between lines. There were also discrepancies in the size of the trains themselves, station designs, and fare structures across various lines operated by different companies. Hence, consolidation was needed, and efforts began in the mid-20th century. By the 1950s, the New York Transit Authority was established. This consolidation aimed to streamline operations, create a more unified subway network, and improve coordination across the entire system. For context, following unification, the network was basically divided into two systems. You had IRT lines becoming Division A and BMT becoming Division B. Because A tunnels were physically smaller, the two networks remained divided for passengers. In fact, for safety reasons, only freight trains from the A division can pass between both lines. And all throughout this evolution, fare collection and accounting were a complex part of the equation. And given the understandable security concerns at hand, both of the original companies that built the network and later the city transit authority themselves were highly secretive about the entire operation of how money was moved across the subway network. Be that as it may, the documentation suggests that the forgotten money train has had a very long history. The earliest mention of the money train concept that I could find comes from 1904, the opening year of the subway. The train was noticed when a rail fire had blocked the tracks, and at the expense of nearly hitting a fire crew on the elevated structure, the officials ran the money train past the site, perhaps underlining their priorities. The next mention comes from the New York Times in 1905, a year after the subway opened, recalling that the train rolled through the system on a secretive and ever-changing schedule. The trail goes dark from there until the 1920s when a series of at least 10 armed robberies occurred when the money train schedule was allegedly leaked. The connection was made in 1925 when officials noted that a robbery occurred just five minutes before the money train arrived at the 50th Street Station. 
implying that the thief knew when the station crew would be preparing the bags of coins for the train. In total, $342.50 was ripped off that day, or about $6,000 in today's money. The New York Times also suggests that there were attempts to rob the train itself, all of which were unsuccessful. But perhaps the most revealing event regarding the security protocol around the service was witnessed on November the 11th, 1922, when a money train collided with a shuttle at the 57th Street station around 1.05 a.m. The Evening World reported that for two hours, Sergeant Timothy McCook and two patrolmen stood guard until the money could be transferred from the wreck to a new collection train. Perhaps demonstrating that in the 1920s, there was an effective protocol for alerting not only the city police to the site of such a sensitive situation, but also the support logistics required to bring a standby train to transfer the cash. But beyond that, as network unification commenced and the subway traded coins for tokens, robbery attempts diminished significantly. Even so, by 1951, New York City's New Transit Authority unleashed its network-wide money train operation. These trains would run the subway tracks six nights of the week to collect cash from up to 40 stations each before returning to a secret location on J Street where the money was sorted. Within the J Street station itself was a garage-style door covering a utility tunnel opposite the platform. This tunnel would align with the train's loading door so that agents could securely pass loads of cash between the train and the collection facility. According to OntappedCities.com, J Street Collection Center was also strategically located, as the system planners knew that it was positioned atop a subway station where hidden tunnels could be built to connect the building to the lines. The entire operation was extremely secretive. In fact, it could even be argued that had the New York Transit Museum's exhibit the Secret Life of 370 J Street not been made public, almost no one would have understood the significance of that building. Constructed in 1951, 370 J Street looks like a typical office building with a large limestone facade to the extent that most of its own tenants had no idea that the building's second floor had a secret elevator to transport money from the tunnels below the basement's own building. Think about how crazy that is. For the better part of a century, Brooklyn used a building with hidden passages leading into the subway tunnels where millions of dollars were moved around six days out of the week. It really makes you wonder about what other solutions and perhaps tunnels they came up with to protect these systems. And in a way, these measures are rather reminiscent of the innovations we need to create these days to protect our privacy. I mean, mistakes were bound to happen from the start, and I'm sure we can all relate. I'm no better. In fact, when I first started this channel, I made my email address available, leading to an insane level of privacy invasion by scammers, spammers, and all the rest of it. But in a way, this was a great learning experience as it brought a new awareness of just how big my digital footprint really is. This is an issue most of us can probably relate to. And thanks to our sponsor, Delete Me, you now have the power to remove your personal data that is exposed online. Delete Me is a fantastic service that will erase your personal data from people search websites. I'm talking about hundreds of data brokers selling your information. And it's an ongoing process. Once they clean house, they'll keep scanning for new data that shows up so they can remove that also. Thanks to Delete Me, I could remove old listings containing my vital records like former addresses, professional background, and even family photos. Now, with Delete Me's ongoing monitoring, I feel confident that I can continue enjoying the privacy everyone deserves. I'd encourage you to do the same. Just to add a little emphasis, according to Duke, data brokers have gone as far as selling information related to U.S. military personnel. So if you want to get your personal information removed from search results on the web, go to joindeleteme.com slash SoCash. DeleteMe is offering 20% off their privacy plans to all my viewers with code SoCash. Again, that's joindeleteme.com slash SoCash, promo code SoCash. The money train concept was brilliant. It alleviated the issue of inconveniencing everyone from the difficulties of getting highly secure transportation to and from stations using overstreet transportation. And since the subway itself reached every station within the network, the money train was an obvious solution. This is why, for the better part of a century, the city used them in various forms. 
Then, finally, in 1995, the veil was lifted, and the concept of the New York money train became well-known public knowledge, as it was depicted in the blockbuster movie Money Train. Starring Woody Harrelson and Jennifer Lopez, the subway car used in the film was a modified R21. The rolling stock was modified by the Metropolitan Transportation Authority and film crew into an imposing subway train covered in silver armor plating and equipped with flashing orange lights and sliding barred doors like those in jail cells. After production, the car was donated to the New York Transit Museum and was stored at the Coney Island Complex as of February 2010. After the film was released, the public, especially tourists, would photograph and film the money train any chance they got basically dismantling years of secrecy in an instant. There was also a robbery attempt that imitated the film in 2003, followed by some reports that would suggest that the MTA discouraged this type of PR. For example, a 2003 article by the Daily News called the concept an urban legend and asked the MTA directly if the money train exists, to which the MTA responded, quote, we don't talk about the money train, I don't know if it exists or if it still runs. As the years passed, the rolling stock became obsolete. And by 2006, the city had been using the same money train carriages for over five decades. The interiors were extremely basic, with lockers, a few tables, and barred windows becoming a utility from another time. The times were changing fast. The MTA put a strong emphasis on cash-free transactions, limiting travelers to vending machines in strategic locations at subway stations where you could purchase Metro cards using cash. From there, automated machines rapidly sorted up to 30 bills per second, so a major facility with secret tunnels and elevators was just no longer needed. And perhaps it's just as well, as the money train was not meant to last. In 2006, with new payment methods in place, the service fleet was terminated permanently, and now, only traces remain.